Associate uh, Public Affairs and Religious Director of the Northeastern Conference. Uh, good afternoon to everyone who is joining us today for this exciting program that the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department of the Northeastern Conference has planned. We're here to address a very pertinent, important issue. As we all know, that's before the Supreme Court. And I have to say, we recognize the importance of looking at this topic because as I look at the numbers that are on here, we have over 800 people uh, moving quickly to 900 people in attendance at this meeting this afternoon. I think that's wonderful. We praise the Lord for your attendance, for your interest, and for this gathering. Uh, we will probably start today, but we certainly won't finish. There's a lot that has to be studied and looked at in regards to this whole issue of uh, a day of worship before this country. I'm going to ask uh, that uh, somehow Dr. Uh, Brown, if we would just mute everybody so that we won't have any, any disturbance. We will have time in the program. We will entertain dialogue and questions. This time, I'm going to ask everyone, just mute everyone, uh, Dr. Uh, Brown, so that we can all hear those who are speaking. God bless you. This program is going to be uh, presented by uh, Dr. Brown and the individuals that he has invited. So this time, I'm going to turn it over to my very able, experienced associate who has been serving the Northeastern Conference for many years in the Department of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty. We welcome all of you who are on here on behalf of our wonderful president, uh, Dr. Abraham Jules, our illustrious secretary, uh, Dr. Eldine King, and our newly elected treasurer, uh, Brian McDonald, and the entire conference staff. My name is Dr. Alan Martin. I serve as the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Director of Northeastern Conference. We welcome every single one of you to this program this afternoon, and we're certain that you'll be abundantly blessed as a result of being with us for what's going to be disseminated and shared with you to help us as we look at this vital and important topic. God bless you.
Say something about Wi Fi or dialing. You know. Said the host would like to speak. Greetings, beloved. Just a moment here. We are going to, let me just, uh, one second. Greetings, beloved. We are so happy to have you uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, we have hit capacity. I was trying to get the capacity increased uh, the person to do that is out of the country, and where he was, uh, the connection was not very good, and so I was unable to get it uh, increased. However, I have wonderful news for you. If you know of people wanting to watch this program, and it will be a good program, if you know of people wanting to watch this program but unable to do so, the Queensboro Temple Seventh-day Adventist Church is simulcasting this broadcast on their YouTube channel. Just go into YouTube and search for Queensboro Temple, and you will be able to watch the broadcast 
as it happens in real time. If you would be kind enough to forward that message for me, I would deeply appreciate it. We anticipate having a blessed time together here this afternoon. And I want to thank God for what he is doing to get his church ready for his return. Now, just give me a moment. Let me mute everybody. Okay, until we get to the Q&A period, uh, I'm not going to allow you to unmute yourself. We need to uh, have it quiet so that the presenters are able to uh, present. Now, uh, today's presentation is very important. And for me, it is an answer to prayer. Uh, for years, I've been asking the Lord to do something where uh, on the Supreme Court level, something could happen to turn back uh, some of the um, negative things that have transpired over the years. Now, I'm not going to uh, try to break that down for you. We have some experts that are going to do that today. And uh, I'm happy to present to you uh, Dr. John Ashmead, who is the Associate Director of Religious Liberty for the Atlantic Union, and Dr. Nicholas Miller, who wears several hats, including his work for the Lake Region, uh, for the Lake Union, and for Andrews University, and he just got another hat. I, he, I'm gonna have to ask him to remind me what that one is. But um, we had some other folks that we were bringing in today, but scheduling being what it is, uh, they weren't able to join us. But I need you to appreciate that our time together this afternoon will help you know how we need to be praying as a church right now, what we need to be asking God for. Uh, some historic things are happening. There is a case before the Supreme Court right now, and our presenters are going to walk us through the history uh, of this issue, uh, why this present case is so important, what's happening with it. They'll read the tea leaves, so to speak, and give some very good insight into this whole issue of Sabbath accommodation. When I first became Director of Religious Liberty for Northeastern Conference quite a few years ago, there was the occasional uh, letter that we would have to write to help people get Sabbath accommodation. And in the years that have passed, this has turned into a major issue. We've had to go to court on behalf of church members. People have gotten fired. And so as we near the end of time, we know that uh, increasingly there are going to be issues that we have to confront. And my theme song is All for a Faith that will not shrink. And that's what all of us need to be praying for. And so without further ado, I would like to present to you Dr. Ashmead and Dr. Miller. They're going to give us the history. They're going to walk us through how we got to where we are now. They will lay out for you what the issues are. And then once they have completed their presentation, we will take um, questions. And for, pe for people who want to ask questions, but who are unable to get into uh, Zoom. They can either put it in the chat in YouTube or you can text me your question. You can text me your question and I will pose it to them. My number is 917-917-864-864-6286-6286. And once again, if you would be so kind as to alert members who got shut out that they can view this from the Queensboro Temple Seventh-day Adventist Church YouTube channel is on now. I just ran it to the sanctuary to make sure it's broadcasting nicely. Hello, QBT family. Praise the Lord for you. Um, and so at this time, without further ado, um, I present to you uh, attorney John Ashmead and attorney Nicholas Miller. And I will let you all, uh, in the order that you would like to, walk us through what's going on, what the issues are, how did we get here, what's happening now, and give us some of your um, anticipation of what may happen because we, we do anticipate a decision being handed down from the court uh, in the not too distant future. Dr. Ashmead, Dr. Miller, I turn it over to you. Dr. Brown, uh, could you kindly put the, what the information in the uh, chat that you just stated? Your yes. phone number as well as uh, Queensboro so, so those can get it. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. In fact, those are in the chat now. If you look, you'll be able to see it and you can you can forward that 
uh, to the uh, folks. Let me just get our participant. Um, let me get our panel in here. Okay, let me spotlight you guys, and away we go. John, you appear to be up first, so do you oh, want to lead? Okay. How do you Sure. How do you want to let, let, let's let's see how this uh, plays out. Um, so first, let me just thank uh, Dr. Martin and um, Pastor Brown and their team for the for their invitation to participate this evening. And it's certainly a pleasure uh, to participate with uh, Nicholas Miller and to have so many people join us uh, for this program. Um, I, I think maybe just a, a quick overview of how did we get here, where we are currently. Uh, so very briefly, I think in around 1964, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act, and part of the act, the focus was on helping uh, employees deal with uh, discrimination in the workplace. And, you know, Congress wanted to make sure that employees would not have to choose between their faith and their jobs. And, you know, that's something important. So it's an important value in this country. And uh, this is this was reflected in this act. Um, in 1972, there was a case, uh, the name of it uh, was Hardison, and uh, a suit was filed. This involved someone who was employed uh, by TWA, and uh, while being employed by TWA, he became convicted of the Seventh-day Sabbath. I think it was the uh, Church of God, and uh, Worldwide Church of God. He became a member of that church. And as a result of that, he requested an accommodation from his employer. And they went through a number of different steps to, uh, you know, try to accommodate him. And ultimately, TWA felt they couldn't accommodate him. And so he was uh, terminated from his job. He filed suit. And, you know, the suit wound its way up through the courts to the Supreme Court. And one of the critical issues um, in that case was he worked in, in, in a, an environment where there was a collective uh, bargaining agreement. And uh, that those agreements sort of privilege, privilege seniority. So people who are have, have been there longer, uh, they have the opportunity to get the prime days off. And, and so that worked to the detriment of this Sabbath keeper and uh, when this issue came before the court, the court sort of took a view of all the facts of the case and something very interesting the court said, um, looking at uh, Title VII, you know, an employer is required under this act to provide a reasonable accommodation to someone's uh, religious practices. And the, the act actually says, unless the accommodation causes an undue Bird. And so that's really the issue the court was trying to figure out whether or not uh, TWA provided a reasonable accommodation. And the court ultimately concluded that TWA made substantial efforts to accommodate his religious practices. And um, unfortunately, it would have resulted in an undue burden. One thing I think this was in a footnote um, in the case, the court said, something along the lines, you know, of whether or not they could have hired someone to fill in his spot and they would have, it would have required TWA to, you know, pay some ex excess salary. And they use the word, you know, you don't have to accommodate if there, if there is a de minimis cost. Now that wasn't the primary holding of the case. The primary holding of the case was focusing on whether or not you know, accommodating would take precedent over the collective bargaining agreement. But since then, the courts have seized on this whole issue of the word de minimis. When you think of de minimis, it means minimal. And so the, the issue is, you know, whether or not an undue burden means minimal. And that's what the courts have been grappling with for years. And unfortunately, uh, courts have seized on the language of the Supreme Court where it says, you know, uh, reasonable accommodation doesn't need to be anything more than de minimis. And it often results in cases filed by religious adherents being dismissed um, without a real, you know, you know, trial to sort of assess whether or not there's a real accommodation. And so for years and years, you know, 
the religious adherents have been filing suits and trying to deal with this. And now we are at the place where the court is ready to reconsider what a reasonable accommodation means. And I think at this point, I'll turn over to Nick to talk about the current case and maybe he can you know, share his insights and we can go back and forth from there. Good, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Ashmead. That was a very nice statement of the history of the, uh, of the case. Um, I, just to put it in context, um, you know, religious freedom is supposed to be our, um, one of our most valued and highly protected freedoms, right? It's there in the First Amendment and under the Constitution, it gets the highest level of constitutional protection. We call it strict scrutiny. Uh, along with freedom of assembly and speech, uh, as well as protection from racial discrimination. Um, but in the Hardison case, uh, in the, the, you know, came down in 70, 1977, as you stated, they equated undue hardship or substantial burden with de minimis. And that was, um, to, to give the larger context, that made religion the least well protected civil rights in the workplace. So uh, racial discrimination uh, would certainly get what we call um, strict scrutiny, the equivalent of strict scrutiny. Um, handicap discrimination, uh, the American with Disabilities Act, the employer has to sh show a substantial hardship um, and it's at least a, a medium level of scrutiny. And so, religion suddenly goes from being a well-protected, you know, fundamental right to being really in the lowest tier of protections. And so that's what uh, our, our current uh, case brings is, is religion going to be placed back into at least the middle tier, if not the highest tier of civil liberty protections in the workplace? Um, so to talk about the current case, you know, it's usually Adventists that are involved in these cases uh, because of their need for, for Sabbath off. And there's been a number that have come through the courts that we hope could go to the Supreme Court. But ironically, of course, when the case actually gets to the Supreme Court, it's not on behalf of a Sabbath keeper. It's on behalf of a Sunday keeper, uh, a former missionary to Africa, uh, Gerald Groff. Uh, it works in uh, worked in Pennsylvania in the post office, um, and he is a committed. He believes that the Sabbath should be kept on Sunday, but he keeps it like Adventists do the Sabbath, and he won't work, which is you know sort of rare in the uh, in the larger Christian community. But he's a man of conviction, and uh, ironically, and 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 this is an important part of this case, right? Why are why are Sunday keepers having trouble? keeping their day of worship holy. You know, for over a hundred years, mail didn't run on Sunday. What changed that? Why didn't, why did Mr. Groff need his Sunday accommodated? And the question, the answer is because Amazon entered into a contract with the post office for the post office to deliver Amazon deliveries on Sunday. Now think about that for a moment. Um, what is there that is challenging the religious beliefs of Americans, if not the Amazonification or the corporatization, right, of America that is saying we need delivery every day of the week? Um, and so, so he's not an Adventist, but an Adventist gets involved in the case. Our, our friend, John and I have a friend, uh, Alan Reinach, who's an attorney for the Pacific Union Conference out in California. And he has developed a national reputation on these issues of workplace accommodation for holy days. And so uh, folks in Pennsylvania reached out to Alan and Alan represented this man down in the lower courts uh, where he lost uh, because the post office was arguably able to show there was more than a de minimis burden. There weren't enough uh, other uh, postal persons to sh swap shifts with. They didn't have to pay overtime. And ultimately, it was the union issue, I believe, uh, that uh, didn't require um, a violation of seniority to, to, to cause someone else to, uh, to take the Sunday shifts. So he loses in the court below. It goes on appeal. And at that point, Allen uh, calls on a, uh, the biggest First Amendment religious freedom 
uh, religious group in the country, First Liberty, which offer, uh, um, operates out of Washington, D.C. And they, they take the case and manage to get it heard by the Supreme Court. Uh, and we had both Alan and, and one of the attorneys that was helping with the argument in the Supreme Court. We interviewed them a few weeks ago. Um, now, we don't have a result yet. I mean, that's, that's, you know, it's still, we're having to read the tea leaves. Um, but there was an argument, and the argument appeared to go quite well uh, for, for our side, if you will. And, and maybe now that I've kind of gone through all of that and set the stage, I know both uh, John and I have listened to the arguments. Do you want to give your assessment, give an overview of the arguments? And sure, sure. So uh, let me share a quick anecdote. And I think this will be helpful to sort of frame the argument uh, that I listened to. And, and you know, I'm, I'm certainly interested in your perspective as well. Uh, when, when I was in law school, I was taking a constitutional law class and we were at the beginning of the class. The professor was introducing the case that we were going to discuss. And a friend of mine walked into class late. And the, the, the professor saw an opportunity to you know, embarrass him. And so as he sat down, took his books out, he said to the, my, my classmate, who happened to be my best friend in law school, Mr. Jennings, can you tell us what this case is all about? And so my friend had not briefed the case the night before. And so he quickly thought, I'll just say a few words. So he said, this case is, means that everything is political. And the professor then said to him, can you expand on that, Mr. Jennings? And so what he said was, very slowly, everything is political. And the professor then said to him, I, I really don't understand what you mean by that. And so my friend now, who happened to be from Jamaica, uh, switched over into Patois. And he said, everything is political. And when he did that, the class then erupted in laughter and the professor sat down and we lost control for 10 minutes. But when I listened to this argument, that was the thought that I had. Everything is political. If we go back to the Hardison case, the Hardison decision was sort of came from the conservative wing of the court. And it, from my perspective, they were very interested in protecting business interests. But as we listen to this argument, and, and let me just also add, um, in the Hardison decision, Justice Marshall, one of the liberals on the court, wrote a dissenting opinion, and he was joined by Justice Brennan, another liberal. So, you know, while everything isn't as black and white, it was mainly the the, the more conservative justices who signed on to protecting business interests in Hardison. And we saw in, in, in the Groff uh, oral argument, a switch. In, in Groff, you saw the more conservative justices now uh, seeming to lean towards protecting the interest of the religious adherent. And it was the more liberal justices, it happens to be three of them, who were really challenging and seemed to come across as more uh, business-centered. And, and that was quite a contrast in, in, in my perspective um, to between the two cases. Uh, the one thing that I will say as I listen to the arguments, I, I think there was an overall consensus among the justices that uh, undue hardship does not mean de minimis. Uh, it, it just, it's, it's, it's completely inconsistent with the language. If, if something is hard, it, it's more than minimal. And, and so I, I think the justices were certainly grappling with uh, that issue and how to address it. Um, the, the other thing that came across it, and I listened, I think it was Justice Gorsuch, who was, as he grappled, as he argued back and forth with the Solicitor General and the petitioner's counsel, he was trying to find some consensus and kept drawing both of them to some degree of consensus around the, the issue of what undue hardship meant. And it seemed that at points that they were sort of on the same page, that undue hardship is, is more than a de minimis uh, standard, but you know, they had their areas of disagreement. So it, you know, ultimately, it'll be interesting to see what they, um, how the court ultimately rules, but I, I think that we will 
land in an area where there will be more protections for uh, religious believers with the court's uh, upcoming decision. Um, before both of you continue, I realize we may have had some people uh, who came in after you started, and I just want to take two seconds to make sure everyone is on the same page before you continue, because um, the the issues at stake are, are are pretty incredible. If you just joined us right now, a case is before the Supreme Court that's significant because it could uh, straighten out, iron out, clean up some problems that currently exist for religious liberty directors everywhere as a result of an earlier case. That earlier case means that the employer for the shabbiest of reasons can deny religious accommodation. And it's been a huge problem. And for years, I've been praying that God would bring a case to the Supreme Court where the case in question could be overturned and we wouldn't have quite such a hard time of it trying to uh, give accommodation for our members. Uh, Dr. Ashmead and Dr. Miller are laying out for us the earlier case, which was TWA versus Hardison, and addressing the present case, which is before the court right now. No decision has come down yet. But I hope as you're listening to them that you're understanding that as a church, these are things we need to be praying about because before Jesus comes, it's going to get harder as opposed to easier. And every break that we can get, we need to be praying for it so we can get the work done. So that's just a quick catch up. If you just joined us, uh, Dr. Ashmead and Dr. Miller continue to walk us through where we are right now, what some of the issues are, and most importantly, what we need to be looking for and praying about. And after they walk us through the cases, I'm going to ask them to speak about accommodation generally, because the issue of being able to get off from work so you can keep the Lord's Sabbath uh, is a mission critical issue. And you're going to be you're going to be tested on it more and more as we near the end of the close of time. Gentlemen, I throw it back to you. So I, I think that was very well stated. Uh, the, the importance of this case is truly significant for Adventists. I would say it could be the most important case for, for our questions of religious liberty um, in, in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, Sabbath accommodation is our single biggest uh, challenge, if you will. I think it's something like two Adventists every day have some sort of challenge uh, to either keeping a job or getting a job because of the Sabbath. And in every union, there are letters sent out. And, and fortunately, we're able to resolve many of these at the letter writing stage, but not all of them. And members still lose their jobs. Members don't obtain jobs. My own children have not have been denied jobs because of, uh, because of Sabbath issues and in, in seeking employment. Uh, and Ultimately, the level of protection is quite thin, right? You can write a letter, you can raise the law, but when push comes to shove, the employer really doesn't have to do very much. And it's really because of this de minimis standard that came in the Hardison case in 1977. And I, I think John's characterization of the oral argument is quite right. No one was really defending the de minimis standard. Even the government on the other side that was defending the status quo kind of said, well, that de minimis language was just, um, it was just uh, cover, it was just rhetoric. Um, and, and of course, we wouldn't uh, want to stand by that rhetoric. But then they tried to argue that the way the cases had developed over time uh, hadn't really applied the de minimis standard. And so the court, even while setting aside de minimis, should merely embrace the existing uh, legal framework. Uh, I, I think that's a hard argument to make. Clearly, courts and decisions have reflected, have taken seriously the de minimis standard. And I think the good news is that there will be a result which is more protective of religious freedom. Um, the question is, is it going to be mildly so? Or will there be a significant change? And that's that's what that's what remains to be seen. It would be very surprising to to, to many of us if if uh, the court ruled entirely for the uh, for the side of the government. Um, but I think the, the I see in the in the written chat there's some people who are raising the question: Is why would an Adventist defend 
uh, Sunday keeping, because we know that Sunday keeping isn't the correct day of worship. And I, I think as Adventists, we need to realize that Sunday laws aren't just wrong because they have the wrong day. They're wrong because they seek to use coercion and forms of worship. And Saturday laws would be just as wrong as Sunday laws, even though we believe that Saturday is the correct day because you would be coercing worship. And likewise, people who have convictions about Saturday or Sunday or Friday, as, as some Muslims do, it is their convictions and their religious freedom that needs to be protected. Um, and so this case actually highlights the fact uh, that this is a principle for us as Seventh-day Adventists. We don't agree with Sunday worship, but we do agree that everyone's conscience should be respected and protected. And that's what we're doing, have done uh, for this gentleman. And we ask others to do the same for us, right? Even those that don't agree with us, we are requesting that you respect our convictions and our consciences. Um, but I think the larger point from, from this Sunday issue is, you know, Sunday keeping is a majority position in the country. At least many more people keep Sunday than, than Sabbath, or at least observe Sunday in some way. So where, where have we come when even Sunday keepers aren't safe in government positions, in having their freedoms protected, right? Think about that for a moment. In some ways, if, if Sunday keepers' days of rest aren't being respected, we can kind of view them as the canary in a coal mine that the forces of secularism and capitalism and corporatism that don't take religion seriously are really becoming quite powerful in our society. And that sacred time of any kind, whether it be Sunday or Saturday, just the notion of sacredness is under assault by commercial um, forces in America that want to monetize and com, um, consumerize everything. And surely that is something that our Sabbath should be speaking to, right? How many of us think about our Sabbath in terms of a response, not just to having the right day of worship, but a response to the commodification and the corporatization and the unfettered capitalism that seeks to flatten all spiritual values and view people merely as producers and consumers. And how might we think about the Sabbath and Sabbath and Sunday issue somewhat differently if we brought out that aspect of our message more clearly? And maybe I'll throw it back to you, John, to... Sure, I, I think you've raised a really important question and, and you've made a, a great point. Um, if you look at uh 1977 when the hardison decision was made uh sunday keepers were in the majority and th there was no real sense that their religious freedoms were at threat were at risk uh we have come a far way now and it seems there is a greater sense within the christian community and certainly with the court that uh, Christianity is at risk as secularism grows and gains more power. And, and so we, we, we are potentially seeing a division um, between corporate interest and religious interest. I, I think if we look at our overall politics right now, conservative conservatism makes up corporate interest as well as religious interest and, and and they're both aligned along the you know the view of limited government and 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 now we are seeing religious folks perhaps taking a view of using the government to protect their interests and so heightening regulation in a sense to protect their interests against corporate interests and secular and the secularization that's taking place within society. And so I think that's an interesting dynamic that I, you know, I thought came through as I listened to the arguments. On from the liberals, what I sensed occurring is their fear that religious people are now, you know, entering the public square to impose their views quite broadly on everyone else. 
And, and let me sort of give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about. Um, if, if you have a situation where someone is the clerk for a town and they are the ones who issue marriage licenses, and you know, in, in this country now, we, we certainly have um, gay marriage as a constitutional right, but the clerk says, well, I have a personal objection to gay marriage, and so I am not going to perform my duty of um, issuing marriage licenses to everyone. And, and I think liberals are becoming increasingly concerned that you know Christians are imposing their views quite broadly and using these civil rights uh, laws to sort of you know give them the protection that they need to do so. And so that's what I think I heard from the liberal wing of the court. They were trying to make sure that you know, sip, uh, protections for religious folks remain balanced within our society. And that's sort of, you know, the politics that I was referencing that I see taking place in the arguments between uh, both sides. Well, it is one of the rare times or the less common times when the liberals were interested in protecting big business interests. Uh, yeah. And, and th there was a little irony there. And, yeah. you know, one can't help but wonder if that was um, in part because the religious practice at stake was that of someone from the majority, right? right. They, they didn't mm -hmm. see a marginal and excluded uh, uh, minority group. They saw, you know, the, the, the majority religious, a uh, majority religious practice before them. And um, so it, it is interesting in the way the the dynamic has shifted in that regard but i do think it's a mistake to overread this case i see some comments in the chat that you know if if sunday is protected here then we're that's moving us towards mandating sunday worship and i just that's simply not this case this case is about the freedom of the individual to not have the government force him to violate his conscience by working on a holy day whether it be sunday or Saturday or Friday, uh, it presses in the opposite direction of mandating uh, days of worship or or causing people to violate their days of worship. So I just think Can we I need just to be add careful. Something really quickly, now? yeah, yeah. So it, it, and and based on those comments, uh, you know, I, I see. Look, we we don't live in a bubble. Um, you know, we 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 have a we have to form alliances with people at times. Um, just just to highlight, um, the Atlantic Union joined an amicus brief um, with the Jewish community in this case um, because we, we have an alignment with them. We are both Sabbath keepers. Um, we don't necessarily have the same beliefs, um, but on this issue, we are aligned. And so where we find individuals who we, we can form alliances with, it behooves us to do so. We, you know, especially as Adventists, we're in a minority, and and so our, we can only marshal our power if we we join with folks on issues that you know support our interests. And at times we will need to protect the interests of others, um, you know, in the name of protecting our own interests. And I think that's the case here. It you know if if we are able to prevail in this case. There will. This is not about Sunday laws. This is about the freedom um, um, to, you know, of someone who is dealing with their job or their faith, and that's something that we deal with. And if 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 the court rules favorably, it will benefit us in the long run. Well so, stated. Yes. Here's the thing, uh, Dr. Niller and Dr. Um, Ashmead. Uh, years ago, when um, Years ago, when uh, Mitz Tyner was the religious liberty director for the um, North American division, uh, he frequently made a point that I wholeheartedly endorsed. He pointed out that the more fairness you have for everybody, the better off we are. I want you to think about this for a moment. Fairness freely distributed even when people whose positions we don't agree with are benefited from the fairness. The fact is 
that when a greater number of people are able to um, uh, operate uh, in a fair manner, that tends to put all of us in a better position because I want you to think about what the reverse is. The reverse is that today, if you are able to pick on one group of people by calling them a derogatory name and making it seem as though it's okay to, to attack this particular group, what you don't realize is once you start dehumanizing one group, that dehumanization works like a cancer. And before you know it, you're now able to attack other groups because you started breaking down the protections that keep us all safe. So when, when we think that it's okay to treat this particular group badly because we don't like them anyway and you all deserve what you get, what you don't understand is it's like drugs in the black neighborhood. Years ago, people didn't get bent out of shape about drugs in the Black neighborhood because it's in the Black neighborhood. But guess what? The drugs had no intention of staying in the Black neighborhood. And as they begin to flow out and end up in other places, now all of a sudden, it's a problem. But it highlights the fact that we should have been protecting everybody's neighborhood because at some point, if one neighborhood is not safe, then many neighborhoods are not safe. We've got to get away from this narrow way of thinking that says, if something doesn't line up with my point of view, it doesn't deserve protection. Because even Ellen White said, it would be wrong to pass legislation even for the true Sabbath because Christ allows choice, Satan compels. God has no interest in compelling the conscience. He wants to woo and to win the conscience to his side. So this is a, a very important consideration as we go. So I, I did, uh, that's where, very well stated, uh, Elder. And um, I, I, I think it's, I did see in the chat a question about what happens if we don't get a good result here. Let's say, and of course, you're never 100% guaranteed everything. We could lose or we could win, but it would be a very weak win and we would want stronger protection still. And the answer to that is we continue doing what we've been doing in the past, which was an attempt to pass legislation. Um, there's something called the Workplace Religious Freedom Act that the Adventist Church and various other religious groups have been promoting for many years, um, a couple of decades actually. And this act has passed in some states. I believe it's the law both in New York and California. And uh, it, it, it exists at the state level, but we're working to get it, to get it passed at the federal level. And those efforts would uh, continue. Um, and actually maybe I can use this to let people know when I was introduced, I was introduced as being uh, at the seminary at Andrews University, which is still true, but I was also introduced as being at the Lake Union, but I have actually left them, left the Lake Union, and I've moved to the Washington DC area, and I've partnered with Washington Adventist University, and they have a center for law and public policy, and um, we've uh, managed to raise some funds to work on these issues and issues like them on Capitol Hill, uh, money for student interns, if there are young people out there interested in law and public policy, uh, we have a pre-law program and a public policy program where you can become a fellow and become a legislative aide and supporter and researcher for Adventist lobbyists on both at Capitol Hill and the United Nations and if this case goes poorly for some reason or doesn't go as well as we hoped, we will be continuing those efforts, both with our dedicated leaders at the NAD and the General Conference and with students who care about this uh, and who are willing to support and work in this field of, of public policy and religious liberty. So I wanted to, to get that out there for any young people or potential students that may be listening. And Nick, I'm anticipating some of the some of the questions that are out there. Uh, should we, as Adventists, be lobbying Congress? 
Well, uh, you're asking me that? <laughs> yes, I'm asking you that. <laughs> well, you may remember uh, one of our most famous religious liberty experts during Ellen White's lifetime was A.T. Jones. Uh, and he uh, wrote, uh, wrote books, um, was a famous advocate for the separation of church and state, probably beyond, beyond what you and I would even seek for. He was against tax exemptions for our religious organizations and Ellen White actually had to, had to reel him back in uh, because he would go too far. Uh, but even he appeared before Congress and testified to them when there were Sunday laws that were being considered. So he lobbied Congress uh, and, and our early Adventist pioneers were known for writing petitions and requests regarding slavery and race and abolition, as well as temperance reform is a very famous case of us not just lobbying Congress, but helping draft legislation and seeking to pass it that dealt with civil moral issues. So Adventism has a very proud heritage of engagement in public policy issues to do with fundamental rights and, and issues of civil morality that we intend to, uh, to, to continue in. But maybe you have some thoughts on it yourself. No, uh, no, I completely agree with you. And you know, the one thing that I, I would like to do at this time, I know that there are PAR leaders on this call. And I would certainly encourage you that whenever you have your religious liberty days, it, it really should be a par day. And you know, you should reach out to your local leaders and invite them to your churches and give them awards, help them, you know, expose them to who we are as people. It's good to have friends because when you have friends, when you have a need, you can reach out to them and they will open doors for you because of the relationship that you've built with them. And so it is critical and crucial for us to be engaged and not to live in a bubble and to you know sort of wait for Sunday laws to be passed. Uh, that is the worst thing to do. We've got to be engaged with the society around us, and we have to expose them to who we are. Um, you know, one of the great you know exposures that we provide to our society is our schools and our hospitals, and we need to do more than that. Uh, we need to be involved within our in our communities and making friends so that when you know the need arises we can you know uh rely on them so, so Dr. Dr. Ashley, so Dr. Dr. Ashley, here's the thing people are made nervous with the idea of lobbying but i want to disabuse some of our viewers of a wrong notion when esther went into the king she was mm. lobbying mm. on behalf of her people and the reality of the situation is lobbying is a way to make thought leaders and other leaders aware of the needs of their constituents. And in our case, lobbying is a way to witness. It is a way to help people. You know what Ellen White says? Ellen White says that many people who today support Sunday legislation have no clue no clue about where it is tending or who is behind it in the first place. And when we lobby uh, the politicians, we make them sensitive to things that they otherwise would never have thought about. That's why support for the Liberty Campaign, which Dr. Martin is going to talk about in a bit, that's why support for the Liberty Campaign is so important because that magazine is a way to sensitize and to educate people to issues and points of view that they otherwise would not be aware of. And I may as well just tell you this. I may as well just tell you this. The idea of lobbying is important because religious liberty is not something we thought up in a back room someplace. Religious liberty is a concept given to us by God. And some have said, well, you know, Bible prophecy says that these things are going to happen anyway, so what's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is. Up until the time probation closes, we as God's people have an imperative to do what we can to fight for the cause of religious liberty. And I'll never forget Dick Finn. Uh, he used to be out on the West Coast. I'm not sure if he's still alive or not. But in a sermon, he made the point, he said, listen, 
if they decide they're going to kill me because I'm doing what God told me to do, I'm fighting now because I want it to be illegal then. In other words, his point is, it is a right position that we have, and we must advocate for the position because it's right. And no matter what's happening around us, no matter if it turns into a losing battle, we have a divine imperative to argue this message. And if it includes lobbying, so be it. But this message must go forward. Let, let, me, let me give you a very concrete example of the importance for us to be engaged with our commu communities. Um, it's not just about being in court. Uh, a few years ago, my hospital was acquiring another hospital. And in order to do so, you know, there are government re regulators who want to make sure that uh, this would be beneficial to the communities. And so there was um, what's called a certificate of need uh, hearing that took place. And, and that was just uh, within the community where the hospital was, where we were uh, going to make the purchase. And it allowed for leaders, civic leaders, uh, community leaders to come and you know, share with the government what their views were or are of, of, of the uh, transaction. And so there came a point where the community could comment. What I observed was that the Baptist, someone from the Baptist church showed up, someone from the Catholic church showed up, someone from the Presbyterian church showed up to make a comment about whether or not um, the acquisition of the hospital would be beneficial to us. The missing voice, was the Adventist church. No one was there on behalf of the Adventist church in that community. And this was, you know, the acquisition could would have a real impact on that community. It could cause, you know, prices to go up. It could result in limited services and all of these types of things that, that are important to people. And as a church that promotes health and healthy lifestyles, and that runs hospitals, you would think that we would have been there to make a comment on this transaction. And, and so my point to all of us is that we have to be engaged with the community around us. And we have to you know, be aware of what's taking place so that we can advocate for the marginalized and the disenfranchised. This is part of the heritage of the church. And we have sort of you know, forgotten that and, and isolated ourselves and the only time we come up for air is to file file a lawsuit to defend Sabbath keepers. But you know our activities should be much broader than that. Uh, and it, and it, go ahead. My ears. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons why uh, right now what we're doing in the Northeastern Conference through our present uh, public affairs religion is broadening our perspective and our influence in the community. That is something we're going to be doing more of. I'm glad to see almost 2,000 people on here because we got a whole lot of work for you to do. <laughs> uh, we've been running these, these programs like this all year long so that our members will understand that we must have a public face. Uh, Dr. Brown, I know you're going to go to the question and answer period, and I know we our time may be limited in that regards. I would like to say something about the magazine, if we can, and so that these august gentlemen who've done a tremendous job thus far in our program will have sufficient time to respond to the, the questions going to come. If you can put up it's the religion. It's an excellent place to do it. Let me pull up the Liberty right. Magazine. Well, please. Magazine. I want to talk a little bit about this, Absolutely. and I want to share with, with um, our conference and our friends what we're going to look at doing. All right? Um, you can put it up there. Uh, yes, Dr. Just, uh, just a moment here. All right. Um, Dr. Martin, I'm going to pull it up for you just now. Let me. Okay, I'll start. Yes, I'll, I'll start so we don't lose any time. Um, I, uh, we were talking as a team as we look at this whole matter of the Liberty Magazine. Now, usually when the Liberty Magazine campaign comes around, it's something that we really don't always give it the attention that it actually needs. And speaking with Bettina Krauss, our very excellent editor, uh, as we look at what's coming out of the court, and I'm glad to see we have Dr. Milde and Washington, pretty sure they're working together on a number of projects while he's there, they're there in the same city. Um, 
we are really want we really are looking at how we can put this magazine in the hands of every pastor i'm not talking about adventist pastor every pastor in the city of new york every church we want to make sure every politician has a copy of the Liberty Magazine. Uh, a short time ago, our mayor made a statement which sort of inflamed a lot of Adventists. They were very upset about it because it talked about the, 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 the relationship, a close union between church and state. And some were very upset about it. I say, calm down, calm, calm, calm down. This is a gentleman that accepts the health aspect of the Advent message. He doesn't understand the prophetic issues and what's going on with Sunday. You know, he, doesn't know, he doesn't know anything about that. And what we need to do is to put in the hands of all of these individuals a subscription of the Liberty Magazine. That is one of the reasons why uh, you've probably seen the video clip that was sent to all the churches. We are asking that for every church to help us sponsor at least 50 subscriptions of this magazine. Every church, we want you to join us and help us to do this. We want to put this magazine in the hands of our um, pastors. I'm talking about um, interfaith community, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, everybody. And we want to put it in the hands of every single public servant, all of our uh, uh, city council members, all of our state assembly members, all of our congressional representatives, our Senate members, all of our community leaders. We wanna put this journal in their hands. And so I'm, I'm going to appeal to every one of us that's on here from your churches, please, you've seen the video clip we sent out, you've seen the letters we've sent out. We still have a little more time. We wanna take the rest of the month of June to see if we can somehow uh, actually sponsor 50 subscriptions from every church. Now, if you don't have the addresses of the public servants in your area to send them to, leave that to us. We'll take care of that. All you need to do is work with your church board, work with your pastor, say, look, we want to sponsor uh, 50 uh, subscriptions of a Liberty magazine. I'm going to ask you, just tell, they can send the check to the Northeastern Conference Religious Liberty Department, and what we will do, we will match uh, the names and the addresses and the contacts with all the, the various individuals in, in your community that we'd like to send a magazine to. You can even suggest to us who you would like it to go to. But the main thing is we want to get this magazine out there because uh, in speaking with Bettina, she's assured me that the upcoming issues are going to be dealing with the rulings from the court. Give us, give us an actual breakdown, actually share with us exactly what's all the dynamics and the legal aspects of it, like these two fine experts as we had uh, this afternoon. Um, in addition to that, let me say this, um, uh, Dr. Miller, we're glad that you're in, in DC and there are times perhaps, uh, last year we took a group of young people from the Northeastern Conference, we're talking about lobbying here. We uh, actually went to Congress, presented a law, uh, a request to change the law in regards to gun violence. We did, it was the first time, and uh, I, one of our groups had actually submitted something to our congressional leaders to influence them to strengthen the gun laws in this country. We would love to come and visit one of our very own Adventists who's down there doing work in Washington so that we could support you and your efforts. If this doesn't go uh, the way we want it, then I think it's time for us to help. You as our representative in DC, we need to support you and to help you in, in whatever you are trying to do. A lot of our young people are very interested in this kind of thing. And we wanna certainly uh, strengthen the alliance I'm glad that you informed us of that. We didn't know about that. And so uh, we want to stay in touch with you so that we can support what you are doing uh, right there in Washington, D.C. And also our very able uh, leader from the Atlantic Union, uh, Attorney John Ashby. Thank you so much, John, for being with us. And we didn't get, we're not, I'm going to say this publicly, 
we want to let you know that uh, all of us mourn the loss of your your wonderful mom. We know this is you're doing this today, and you, you're with us, but you're still recovering from the loss of your mom. And we want you to know that our sin sincere prayers and condolences are with you and your entire family. I turn it back over to you, Dr. Brown. Okay, beloved, we, um, we have certainly, certainly uh, had a very productive presentation of the issues, and it has generated quite a bit of commentary, uh, which I'm not surprised at. I'm, I'm thankful for my church and for the communities in which we dwell, and uh, I'm looking forward to being in heaven uh, with many of you good folks, and uh, we can sit around the tree of life and debate which fruit we like better. Uh, but for our purposes today, I'm going to give both uh, Dr. Ashmead and Dr. Miller a chance to share any closing thoughts they may have, and then we're going to switch gears, and we're going to see if we can entertain some of the questions. Quite a bit uh, of commentary has happened, and uh, we have a thousand people on this line, and my, my report has been that on YouTube, we have nearly 800 uh, devices logged in. So this has certainly been quite the uh, robust uh, discussion today. So I'm going to give each of you a chance to uh, share some concluding thoughts, and then we'll switch gears and see if we can entertain some of the questions that may be out there. Uh, I will tell you how we're going to do that after uh, I give you all a chance just to kind of sum up and to, uh, you know, share uh, any thoughts, observations that you may have. So, uh, Dr. Martin, I, I, I am so grateful and thankful to you for your condolences, and I really appreciate it. And it's my pleasure to work with you and your team. Um, I, I will say I, I am definitely looking forward to uh, the decision that will soon be rendered um, by the court. Um, you know, I will respect the decision, whether I agree with it or not. Um, there, there is more work to be done. And you know our, our work is broader than than any decision by the Supreme Court. And 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 here's what I will say to people: over the last forty years, the makeup of the court has shifted, has changed. The the the, the views of the justices have shift, shifted and changed. And as long as life uh, lasts, we will we should continue to advocate. We should continue to to take a look at these issues and reconsider them. Because the court can change its mind, uh, you know, there's stare decisis, which means the court respects its prior precedence. However, you know, this is a real opportunity uh, for the court to head in a different direction. And um, as Dr. Miller mentioned, you know, we have one of our colleagues in the Parl uh, Department, uh, Alan Reinock, who is who is the the person, the driving force behind this current case. And, you know, I am very proud of him. I am very proud of the, the advocacy of our church. And we need to continue to work together to uh, preach a message of religious liberty for all, uh, not just for us, but for everyone. And if we do so, I think that we will be preaching the three angels' messages. Well stated, uh, John, and, and, and I, too, extend my condolences on the, on the loss of your your mother and join you in the hope that we have for the future. Um, I, I do like something especially that you said earlier, John, you talked about the importance of making friends. Orlin Johnson, our NAD colleague at the um, at Nepal department at the NAD uh, frames it this way. We need to make friends before we need friends, right? Because when you make friends, when you need friends, they know that you're not really being friends. You're, you're just seeking something for yourself. And I, I think that's what's so special about, about this case, is that this is a case where we're helping someone else um, with a conviction that he has that we don't share regarding that same day. Um, and to, to, to echo also what's been said, religious liberty work has tended to focus on the Sabbath. And this discussion here kind of illustrates that. This is a tremendous turnout. I don't think I've been on a webinar uh, for the last two or three years that's had a thousand on Zoom and, a, and nearly a thousand on YouTube. But you put the Sabbath and the Supreme Court together and our people are very interested. But sometimes I feel like we're almost too interested in the question of Sunday laws 
that we leave aside other important elements of our faith and community involvement. And the name of our religious liberty department is really public affairs and religious liberty. And we need to see outside the confines of just Sabbath keeping, as important as that is. And I refer back to an earlier theme of mine that Sabbath keeping involved economic justice and fairness, right? Who rested on the Sabbath? Just the owners of property? Just the mother and the father? No, the children rested. Uh, not just the family, the servants rested, the strangers rested, the animals rested, right? This is a, it has ecological environmental implications. Yet how many of us see the parl work as broader than just keeping the Sabbath? How many of us see it as engaging on issues of social justice that extend beyond just a simple day of worship, but really mark us as people who believe in the principles of the Sabbath, not just on the seventh day, but throughout the rest of the week. And that's what we're trying to do in, in Washington with our, with our new group there. And we want to connect with our church leaders around the country. Gun violence, you know, Ellen White supported laws against alcohol because they hurt innocent women and children, right? The use of alcohol hurt innocent women and children. Well, are innocent children and women being hurt in our society today in ways that we could protect? Many people don't know. We have a policy statement on our general conference. They think, oh, guns is politics. There's a policy statement on our general conference website against civilians having military or automatic or assault weapons. And we could do and say more on that. And it would actually be reflective of our Sabbath convictions, even though it doesn't have to do with a day of rest, because it's about bringing justice to our communities in ways that will make them better for everyone. So I don't want to start preaching here, but I did want to share a few thoughts at the end uh, that, uh, that, that might be appreciated. So thank you for this time, and I look forward to questions. Oh, preach, preach. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, so first of all, before we switch to Q&A mode, uh, I do want to take a moment to thank Dr. Martin. Uh, ever since he became the Religious Liberty Director for Northeastern Conference, um, he has endeavored to pull together the kinds of programs that address the, the relevant issues that are facing us as a conference. And I want to let you know that it is a joy working with him. He is a visionary and he's very collaborative. So, Dr. Martin, I didn't want to wait till you're stretched out in a box up front to talk about how much I appreciate working with you. I want to give you some flowers where you can smell them right now. Uh, I also want to alert you that our next program uh, is being worked on by uh, my colleague and uh, a fellow associate director in the PARL department, Dr. Reginald Guerrier. Uh, once he has the date nailed down for that, we will get that information out to you. He's going to be dealing with another very important issue right now, and that is the issue of immigration. So stay tuned. We will get that information out to you uh, as that program and that presentation is pulled together. And we anticipate that it will once again be a very productive time. Now, just a quick bit in there. I just want everybody to know that we work together as a team. We are a powerful, powerful team in our office, Dr. Brown, uh, his, his years, many years of experience, I yield to him <laughs> on a number of things. Doc, you handle this. And, I, and that's where team ought to work, you follow. My thing is social justice, community engagement. Everybody knows that. And we're pulling our conference in that direction. And But he's helped me with this aspect of it. Then we have our young, uh, energetic, other colleague, uh, Pat, Dr. Reginald Guerrier. And I have to say, that's not all of our team. Our team also includes attorney Charles UC and John Ashby. The, uh, w w together we do this thing. And I thank God for how we've been able to work as a strong unified team. And I think what I'm going to do is add another member to it, Nicholas Miller. So <laughs> he's all the way in Washington, but I think we're going to make him number six. We're going to draft him in here too. <laughs> God bless you. Okay. Now, beloved, we're going to switch to Q&A mode. And we have so many people on the line that it's quite possible that we will not be able to get to many of the questions that you have. However, 
we're going to give it a shot, at least as it relates to getting some of the questions that are out there. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Uh, and I see some of you are doing it already. If you have a question, I want you to raise your hand. I am going to physically unmute you when I see your hand raised. I'll give you a chance to ask your question and I'll give the um, presenters a chance to respond. I know there's quite a bit in the chat while they're talking. I'll go back through and look through some of it, but I have several hands raised already. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take uh, Les Leslie, I'm going to take you first and um, uh, Welcome. Did I? Can you hear yes, me, guys? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Great, great. Uh, no, this was great. This was wonderful. And I just want to address, I want to make two, uh, uh, I want to state two quotes from Evangelism, page 263, and it states, the law of God through the agency of Satan is to be made void in our land of boasted freedom. Religious liberty will come to an end. The contest will be decided over the Sabbath, which will agitate the whole world. And that's from Evangelism 236. But the other thing I wanted to state is coming out of Review and Held, and it goes back to a, 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 a quote, um, something that I mentioned in the comments, and that was Sabbath, uh, and that it states here, it says, uh, it says, a great crisis awaits the people of God very soon our nation will attempt to enforce upon all the observance of the first day of the week as a sacred day. In doing this, they will not scruple to compel men against the voice of their own conscience to observe the day the nation declares to be the Sabbath. So I made a statement that, uh, Sunday is now being considered the Sabbath as well. Okay, Leslie, we appreciate that. I, I do want to encourage folks to um, ask the questions that they may have on the issue that was raised today. We have some very good uh, presenters in the room, and uh, we want to give them uh, opportunity to to address your concerns. Uh, Pamela, I see your hand up. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, can I, can I just say something very quickly um, yes. in response? Um, you know, I know that many of us are concerned about Sunday laws. And, you know, our, our church has talked about this. And the, the real issue that we should look for is a union of church and state, but not simply a union of church and state where the church dominates the state. And... You know, I see no sign of that right now. Um, you know, a, a few years ago, uh, Justice Scalia testified uh, before the Judiciary Committee, and he wanted to share with them his views on what made America great. And what he said was, what makes America great is our separation of powers, meaning between the Congress the executive branches and the judicial branches and because you have that you 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 really you have checks and balances within this country and in addition to that you have two political parties that are still vying and viable and fighting for power and that creates a sort of gridlock that prevents us from going too far left and too far right i will say to you when that when you see that system breaking down and one branch either becoming too powerful or you know, th there is an, a, a real alignment between parties that makes it a one party system, that's when we should be worried. Right now, we have a robust political debate that continues to take place and, and a back and forth between the parties. You know, The likelihood is that the next president could be Republican and following that you have another Democrat. As long as that continues to happen, um, you know, we are not going to be facing the issues that uh, the previous uh, speaker spoke about. Um, before um, uh, Dr. Miller responds, I just, I, several people have been asking about the capacity for donations. We don't currently have a cash app set up, but what you can do, the Northeastern Conference Religious Liberty Department always accepts donations. And I'll tell you how we use the money. 
The money is forwarded to the North American Division Religious Liberty Department for the litigation fund. The litigation fund is a fund that when church members have to go to court because of their faith, that fund helps to pay for the attorneys and for the whole process. So your donations, I tell people all the time, the money you donate today is helping to fight for somebody else, but tomorrow it could be fighting for you. So we don't have a cash app, but you can send in your, your check or donation to the Northeastern Conference Religious Liberty Department, and we track all of the funds, they get where they're supposed to go, and they uh, work to make the work in the Ministry of Religious Liberty uh, viable. Dr. Miller, were you gonna respond or should I take the next question? No, go ahead, take the next question. Okay, Pamela, I'm, I'm unmuting you. Go ahead. Hi, um, Dr. Brown. I don't know if you remember me from probably a month, a month and a half ago, I had called you because um, a coworker and myself work for the um, post office also. I do and, um, okay, so they, um, so the case is still going on. Um, as I told you before, we lost the grievance, we lost the EO case, and now we at the um, EOC level. And um, it has been sent up to um, the person that is handling it on the, um, the post office side. So they have the case. We gave them all the let, um, all our questions and answers. We have submitted everything. But my question is, so they are still taking, um, we don't work on the Sabbath. They're still taking our time and they still harassing us, writing us up. Um, so um, at this point, we, we almost at the part where we don't have no more sick time. We don't have no more vacation. Um, I think my coworker have two more days. I have a week more. Um, but if we call in for sick on our own, that's taking our time. If we need vacation time, that's taking our time. So um, we talked to the person who's representing us on the union level, on our union, and we asked him what's taking the case so long to be settled. And he said to us that he think they are waiting on this case that we're talking about. So my thing is, but so if they take all of our time and we have nothing else, then he's saying they're gonna, re they got the next step, they're gonna try to fire. So what should me and my coworker be doing at this time? Cause we okay. have reached. Right, so, so a couple of things there and I'll let both uh, presenters respond, but a couple of things there. Uh, you're right. This case is important because the TWA partisan case allows them to come up with all sorts of horrible ways to accommodate. And the case that's before the Supreme Court right now, if it is addressed to the extent that we want it addressed, will make it a lot harder for the employer to say, well, I let them use their vacation time, I accommodated them. So the point is a lot is at stake. And this is why we want everybody on this line, everybody on YouTube to be praying and asking God to help us get an outcome that goes as far as we want it to go. Now, the post office is one of our biggest headaches when it comes to fighting for religious liberty. They're right up there with Walmart. But here's what I tell everybody, and this is what I'll tell you. At the end of the day, the one bullet that you always have in your gospel gun is faithfulness. And no matter what that faithfulness costs you, I'm here to tell you, having done this for years and years and years, I have always seen that God honors the faithfulness of his people. And if all of your days are exhausted and you are uh, not reporting to work because of your uh, conviction of what God has asked you to do, I wish I could sit here and tell you, you know, all the different possible outcomes. I don't know that. But here's what I do know. I do know that people who put their foot down and make up their minds that they're gonna be faithful no matter what it costs them. I have always, 100% of the time, seen God manifest himself in their behalf. And, I, and, and I've seen him work it out where sometimes they've gotten jobs that pay twice as much as the one that they lost. 
And sometimes I've seen him uh, just wrought great victories. It plays out so many different ways. That I can't answer, but what I know is that as you put your foot down and insist that you're gonna be faithful to God, I know that he shows himself strong on behalf of his faithful sons and daughters. And as you approach the different aspects of peace, we'll stay in it with you, advocate for you, and just take this thing as far as we need to take it. I would just add to that. I, okay. I honestly, I think the delay is happening because of this pending Supreme Court case. And we'll be praying for your situation and the case, but I think relief is on the horizon. I'm, I'm quite certain that there will be some benefit that this case will give you. And, um, you know, the Calvary is just around the corner, I would say. And Pray and be faithful and hold on because I think uh, I think help is coming. Um, and if it doesn't come in this way, the Lord will bring deliverance in another way. And, you know, I, I think your experience is instructive here of the fact that even though Sunday laws are not pending in Congress, which many Adventists wish were happening and are looking for happening and, and, and can become obsessed about, that our members are still being impacted by for, on their Sabbath keeping. And it sort of underscores my earlier comments about the dangers these days are as much, if not more, from corporate America and commercialism and the need to operate all weekend and, and values being drowned out by, by commerce as they are from, you know, religious government invasion. So, you know, this is, this is not we should be concerned about our Sabbath keeping, not just because Sunday laws might come along someday, but because of all the other pressures that are trying to take our Sabbaths away from us and the meaning of those Sabbaths. And if we could, if we could talk more about the meaning of Sabbath and sacred time and pressing it back against the commercialization of our, of our society and the unfairness in that commercialization, um, maybe other people would care more about our Sabbaths as well. Okay, we have time for a few more questions because we are going to close out soon. Uh, I've been looking through the chat. Folks, I need you to be mindful of something. God had a reason for asking us to honor his Sabbath day. And it will be the last great issue of conflict. Mark it down, make no mistake about it. Today, I encourage everyone to decide that they will be on the Lord's side. You can always find a reason to, to compromise. That's not where the blessing is. The blessing is found in faithfulness to God. Um, listen, I've shared this story many times. I'm going to do it again because it underscores a very important point. Sister Myers used to be a member at the Linden Seventh-day Adventist Church. She's retired, lives out in Long Island now. Sister Myers wanted to drive the bus for the MTA. She got a job with them, and her probation was going well. As she completed her probation, an awful fight was brewing between management and labor, and it was getting very nasty. It got to the point where no one wanted to do anything for anybody. She requested to have Sabbath off. They could have given it to her without issue, without problem. But it had gotten so rancorous and so toxic that they just decided they weren't going to help her. And when she didn't report for Sabbath after her probation was finished, uh, at first it looked like they were going to cut her a break. But not long after that, they called her in. She still wouldn't drive on Sabbath. They fired her. Her case was handled by the Religious Liberty Department, and they put in a complaint on her behalf. At the first level, uh, the administrative uh, person decided she had not been treated fairly in order that she should get her job back. They appealed to the next level. At the next level, it was decided that MTA was in the right, and they reversed the earlier holding. For years, attempts were made 
to get her case to the appeals court of the New York of New York State, the highest court in New York State. And for years, it has seemingly went nowhere. Almost 10 years after she had been fired from her job, New York State agreed to hear her case. The New York State Court of Appeals looked at what happened to that woman. New York State Court of Appeals decided that MTA was wrong, and that was their holding. They ordered that she should receive $50,000 punitive damages. They ordered that she should be given her job back. They ordered that she should be given 10 years back pay for the entire time that she should have been there and would have been there if they had done the right thing. And when she came back to work, she came back with seniority so that there was no more an issue of whether she could or could not have Sabbath law. And not only was she benefited as a result of her faithfulness, but the New York legislature looked at what happened to that woman. And as a result of what she went through, New York State put into effect some of the strongest and most fair and balanced religious accommodation laws in this entire country. So much so that for years we've been endeavoring to get the federal level to mirror legislation that we have right here in New York State, just because of how effective and yet fair and balanced it is. Now, when Sister Myers refused to work on Sabbath, she had no idea that all this was coming down the turnpike. She had no idea that people would be the beneficiaries of the stance that she took. But all these years later, her faithfulness has translated into blessing for people that she will probably never ever meet until we get to heaven. The moral of the story, it pays to serve Jesus. It pays to be faithful. And I will look any and everybody in the face and say, because the Sabbath is going to be the last great issue of conflict, from now, let's begin to demonstrate our confidence in God by honoring what he has asked us to do. And when we get to heaven, you will not be sorry that you put your foot down for the Lord. Amen. Beloved, I see one more hand. We're going to take this, and then we're going to wrap up. If you want to view this again, uh, it will be available on YouTube. You can go to the Queensboro Temple YouTube channel. It will be there, available for rebroadcast. And uh, we are so happy that so many of you were able to come out. Uh, I'm not going to take any more hands after this. So, Jermaine, uh, let me unmute you. I'll take Jermaine, Michael, and Angela, and we're going to close it out there. Uh, Jermaine, you're up first. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for having me on your platform. Um, you know, I was thinking about, uh, as I was listening to this platform, I was thinking about these three Hebrew boys. And there was a situation that had took place. And uh, these, he three, these, these three young men, they knew within their hearts and in their minds uh, what God required. And regardless to whoever set things in front of them, uh, you know, you know, taught them this and wanted to share this information or what have you, they were committed to the word of God. Regardless to whatever the situation, situation may have turned out, they were fully committed. I was remembering about during COVID uh, on my job uh, here in California, and just like other places, they were requesting uh, persons to become vaccinated. Jermaine, and, let me pause you. Jermaine, let me pause you there. Let me pause you there. We, we did have a very good program uh, dealing with that. I do want to restrict the questions uh, to the uh, topic at hand. Um, so I, I do appreciate that. If you have something relating to um, today's issue, I'll take that. Otherwise, I do appreciate you being with us today. And I thank you for your faithfulness. Is it Angelina? Yeah, uh, Angela. Mm -hmm. Let me unmute her. Okay, Angela, you can unmute. Hi, good afternoon, Saints. Um, thank you for the opportunity to not only be in the meeting, but to share my thoughts. Um, 
I, I've also, I'm also one of the, 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 the members of the SDA church who have struggled with the Sabbath and work. And a year and a half ago, the Lord gave me, he has, built, he has been building me to go on my own. And a year and a half ago, he opened the opportunity for me to open my own business. Now, I know um, we're still on Sabbath hours, but what he has impressed on me is to bring in my fellow saints, my fellow ch church brothers and sisters to work it with me and to build this company into a company that, only, that, that not only we can be proud of, but where we can worship him. So um, I don't know if, we're, if I'm on the, the right platform, and, but I would love, love for my fellow brothers and sisters to join me in building this company where we can worship God through our work, through our character, and still uphold the Sabbath. Um, actually, it's interesting that you should say that because more than one person um, has advocated opening your own business as a way to uh, you know, ensure that you have Sabbath accommodation. Um, what I would say to you is um, uh, Dr. Martin has been uh, advocating for a number of things. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to alert you that there is a WhatsApp Religious Liberty uh, chat for Northeastern Conference. And I'm going to encourage you to um, join that group. Uh, there are a lot of resources that Dr. Martin is working on right now. Uh, he's really taking this thing to another level. And uh, I think if you join that group, you can network with some folks and, and be better situated to, you know, to get some of this information out. So it is, um, the name of the group is the, um, uh, the Parl NEC, Parl NEC in WhatsApp. And uh, if you if you join there, that'd be good. Um, some people are a little distressed that I interrupted uh, Jermaine when he was talking about the uh, thing. I just paused him. I didn't cut him off. Uh, but I do need to keep us on point here with our discussion. Uh, some of you are asking about how you can view some of the previous programs that we've had. I have them all saved uh, on Zoom, and I've been endeavoring to get um, our conference to set up a page where I can post all of these things so that you can access it. I'll go back and work on that again because I do have everything and it's just a matter of posting it on a site where you can have access to it. Uh, Sister Alana, you have the privilege of being the last questioner of the day. And uh, once again, the only reason I interrupted Brother Jermaine is because we're talking about a different issue today. I don't want you to think that I have it in for anybody. Uh, love all of you. Some of you I haven't even met yet, but I love you anyhow. Praise the Lord. Sister Lana, go ahead. Hi. Hello. Happy Sabbath. Um, so my question is about the case in terms of precedent. Are there any precedents that are supported in this case? Um, and also for any young people that are interested, like myself, applying to law school, um, what should I do in terms of focusing a little bit more on religious liberty, which is something I am interested in doing um, for attorneyship. Thank you. First, uh, let me commend you for um, your, interest in, your interest in the law. Um, we do have um, an attorney conference in the Atlantic Union that meets uh, on a yearly basis. And um, if you send your contact information to Dr. Brown, he will certainly forward it to me and I'll make sure you get an inv invitation for our meeting um, in the fall. And certainly that's a way that you can begin to uh, network um, with um, other people who are lawyers or thinking about uh, going into the law. Um, I would encourage you to read the Hardison decision and take a close look at Justice Marshall's dissent. Um, I, I am hoping that the current court uh, really takes a good look at that dissent and, and frames their decision based on it. I think if they do that, we will be in a much better position than we are now. So, uh, Attorney Ashby, could you, could you uh, share that? article with us that about that case 
Can you make it available to us if you can? Is that possible so we can send it to those interested? No, the, what, what I'm talking about, oh, the, the, the actual case itself? That sounds interesting. Maybe we could, something we could uh, read. You know what, let me, yeah, I can, I can just try to send you a copy of Justice Marshall's dissent in the case. That's and, it. you know, that would be a good reading for all of us. Yeah, I can certainly do that. So I was just going to add to that, any young people interested in, in law, um, we do have these Adventist law networks, um, but also we don't have any Adventist law school in the United States, in North America. There are some overseas and in, in South America, um, but Washington Adventist University just recently entered an agreement with Baltimore Law School that uh, if you do three years at WAU, your fourth year is, the, is your first year at Baltimore Law School. And so it's a way to combine, it, it's the first Adventist college in North America where law school credit is part of your degree. Um, so that's worth looking into for any young people uh, who are Adventist young people who are interested in law, as well as this public policy program that we have there where, where there's funding for interns who are willing to study and, and work on these issues even at an undergraduate level. So I would recommend any of you uh, in contacting Washington Adventist University and their Honors College, which runs this program. Dr. Brown, is that the last statement? That's the last one. Um, I wanna thank everybody for your good support today. And uh, certainly we've been given a lot to think about. We've been given a lot to pray about. And um, we are gonna close out with prayer and then- I just, I just, uh, Yes, and um, uh, let me throw it to um, Dr. Martin. And um, on our way out, uh, the Aeolians are gonna sing us out singing, it pays to serve Jesus. I think that's a very good way to end our time together. Dr. Martin? I want to, first of all, say thank you to Dr. Brown, who was the person who organized, structured this program, planned it as part of our theme team. I wanna thank him so much for doing an excellent job and promoting it, sharing it all over the place so that we have almost 2,000 people uh, participating today. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for your excellent leadership and efforts on this area. I appreciate you so much, my friend. Um, I wanna say something else uh, in regards to our future work. Um, I noticed that there are a lot of people online who are interested in community engagement. We're getting ready to form in our conference a lay community engagement task force. And that means in every district and every area of our conference, we want our lay people to be involved in understanding and knowing what it is to be in contact with our community to make a difference. So that is something we're looking at doing. Uh, we're partnering for community leaders all over, but we're the pastors, we can't do all the work. And we have such fine lay people who are trained, who are experts in so many different fields, education, law, all over the place. And it's time for us to allow you to work with leadership and empower you to get out there and make that sort of outreach. That's, I just wanted to share that with everybody. Look forward, that's the next thing on our docket. The other thing I wanted to say to you is this. We have also been working recently on the migrant situation in our city. And I thought, I, I, I didn't say anything about this earlier because I wanted to make sure we had some concrete ideas and plans put together before we could, okay? Uh, the mayor is asking for our churches and faith organizations to help him and assist him with dealing with a major crisis that's in our city. And that means uh, the asylum seekers are looking for places to stay. Uh, they need day programs. We are working with that. I am one of the, the, the clergy leaders on the ground, okay, uh, right now uh, looking at this matter with the mayor and his team along with other faith leaders, okay? Um, you'll be hearing a little more about it and what we are going to try to do to help where we can. Our um, 
uh, our uh, uh, asylum seekers are now attending our churches. I had several at my church today. They're, they're coming around, visiting us, and they're trying to become a part of our society. And I think it's part of our mission as Seventh-day Adventists to work with people who are in need. And so that is something that, that I want you to know. Look forward to it. We're going to be sharing information with our conference leadership team first, and then with our, our, our lay members to see exactly how we're going to fit into uh, the frame of things in our city as we structure a ministry to reach our people uh, who are out there like that. All right. Thank you, everybody. Amen. God bless you. And Dr. Miller, uh, Dr. Esme, we want to thank both of you for a very fine contribution today. Let us have prayer. We're going to play the song It Pays to Serve Jesus. And uh, stay tuned because uh, this department under the leadership of Dr. Alan Martin has many fine presentations coming up and you're not going to want, want to miss any of it. Father in heaven, I thank you that we are now one Sabbath closer to your soon return. I thank you that you still honor the faithfulness of your sons and daughters. I thank you that there will never be a moment that we cannot trust you. I thank you that you are a pre very present help in trouble. And I thank you that when you return in power and great glory to all who have been faithful, even unto death, they will hear the blessed words of benediction. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. When those words are declared, may you be speaking to everybody on this line in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.